And welcome to ETF Edge, your go-to place for everything. Exchange traded funds. I'm your host, Bob Pisani. It's been a big July. We're now in August. We had big gains in the S&P 500, up 9%. ETF traders have been very active playing the news on all fronts, surprisingly pouring money into bond funds. We'll talk about that. But let's find out what else traders have been up to and what will be up to what they'll be up to in August. Joining me now, Ben Slavin. He's the global head of ETFs at BNY Mellon. Andrew McCormick is managing director at Wallach Beth Capital. He joins me here at the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, Andrew, I, I was surprised to find sizable inflows into bond funds. So the corporate, uh, I saw uh, government, uh, even high yield. Um, I don't normally cover a lot of inflows uh, because it's hard to figure out what it means. Yeah. But it did st stuck out, stick out to me given that we saw outflows in bond funds for right. a good part of the year. Does this mean anything, these inflows we've well, been seeing in bond Well, I think it was cash. You, I mean, there's been any selling at all, it's been short term. And that's basically cash any, right? If you're in bill, B-I-L, E-T-F, you're basically in cash, right, with like a little bit of a kicker. So it's been people dipping their toes into the water. You're coming out of uh, or what's going to be a U-shaped recovery, I believe. It might already be. If you compare it to COVID, which was a clear V. Um, so the money that's flowing into TLT and GOVT, $9 billion dollars. Six billion into HYG and JNK. So I think the real the real move is institutional investors starting with bonds to, to play the recovery. Eventually, they'll move on equities. So, uh, you know, I'm wondering, Ben, your thoughts on this. Your thoughts on bond inflows and what they meant. I again, I'm not sure historically if it's worth covering this in, in an in-depth manner. But I saw inflows into Treasury bonds. Uh, LQD, which is the corporate bond ETF, had inflows. Uh, JNK, Spider High Yield, uh, USHY, which is the iShares High Yield Corporate, all had nice uh, inflows this month. Does it mean anything? Well, it in part shows a lack of consensus. In part, it also shows or could be masking um, just the dominance of the ETF structure. We've seen significant outflows out of bound mutual funds and inflows across the board into ETF. So there's a little bit of a structural play there. But, Bob, as you said, um, we've seen, you know, flows coming into different parts of this, you know, to this market. Um, you know, more recently, we've seen flows come in the longer end of the curve, which is actually pretty interesting and maybe not quite as significant or on top of the leaderboard, but certainly actively managed fixed income is starting to attract more attention where at least certain retail investors and maybe to some degree some professionals as well are just saying, yeah. look, um, I'll leave it to an actively managed uh, uh, product yeah. or professionals to yeah. handle it at this yeah. market. So a little yeah. bit of everything. Yes. Uh, you, by longer longer term, you mean 20 and 30 year bonds, I yeah. gather. Now, in, in contrast to um, bond flows, Ben, I, I, flows into equity ETF. Now, you tell me you're the expert. It seems kind of flattish to me. Um, there's some growth into some flows into growth funds, maybe some outflows from value, but it doesn't seem titanic to me. And you also highlighted, I asked you about this, um, money into high dividend ETFs like SPHD. Uh, so what are you seeing here in equity flows? Everybody always wants to know what's going on, on the equity side. Of course. I mean, again, there's somewhat of a lack of conviction or consensus here um, with regard to the flow. Um, but yes, um, we're seeing investor interest into dividend ETFs, um, which haven't, um, you know, been out of style, um, you know, for over time. But more recently, we've seen an uptick. SPHD is a good example of a product that really kind of sums up um, where investors are at. I would say it's a way to play this market more defensively, but also try to collect some income. Um, in a way that really avoids, I guess, some of the risk or the perceived risk in the bond market. And we also see in our book at BNY Mellon, really issuers lining up for these type of products. Some of them are passive, you know, dividend oriented. Others are just different types of actively managed ETFs trying in some way to uh, provide a similar type of return stream yeah. for their investors. And high dividend, low volatility, SPHT, of course, has uh, consumer staples, utilities. Yeah, it's, uh, it's actually a defensive play if you're going to yeah. be in equities. Yeah. yeah uh, you know, it amazes me, uh, Andrew, how much gets bet every day on these uh, short-term levered plays. Uh, I, I look at amazement at the ProShares Ultra S&P uh, and the Ultra QQQ, yeah. which provides twice the, 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 yeah. the returns here. So QLD and SSO are the ones uh, to look at here. Um, and the volumes are just titanic. Every yeah, day. we saw some Friday. I mean, I'm encouraged to see that they're finally working or some investors are using the way they were designed, right? So you don't buy, you know, 
you, you don't hedge at the bottom of the market. We saw a 10% pop in the, we talked about this, we saw a 10% pop in the NASDAQ, 8% in the S&P. We actually got to even today. But everyone on Friday on my desk and the clients were saying, hey, are we close here? That's a nice move. Now let's hedge a little bit. So it wasn't necessarily a short bet. It's a percentage of the assets buying these pro shares names. You can find any sector you want in direction, short ETFs and levered ETFs. And then it allows you that little bit of hedge. And I do think, you know, again, we're in a U-shaped recovery, not a V. There's no signs that point to this being a V, right? Gas right. is 475 a gallon, right? right? We, we talked about vacation, how much it costs to go away. So I do think it'll be a little bumpy. And when you can, when active investors and active PMs can make these bets, yeah. okay, I'm just gonna put a little bit short here in case we get a little move down again, that's where they really capture their alpha. So QLD is, just for everybody, make sure everybody's on the same page, is two times the triple Short Q's. Q's, yep. Yeah, so it's two times the Q's. Yeah, two times. Yeah, so if, it, if triple Q's up 1%, you up right. 2% If here. it's the long and the yeah, short. The long. Be, this is down. the long yep. end of that. And that's been getting a lot of play recently. Yeah. Uh, ben, uh, that being said, we've that's seen a, Wood. a strong 10% <laughs> rally yeah. in tech, 8% um, in the S&P or 9% in July. Uh, so maybe people want to hedge the latest rally and get, you know, get other kinds of exposure. Um, there are people who think the lows could be retested fairly easy. So there's a lot of stuff out there that provides downside protection. And that keeps popping up, I see occasionally. Uh, stuff that provides option collars seem to be popular. So I'm looking at this QYLD, which is the NASDAQ 100, 100 covered calls. And it, it tracks an index that holds the NASDAQ 100 stocks and it sells call options uh, on those stocks essentially to collect the, the the premiums here. Uh, and the problem, uh, Ben, Andrew, is that these products are uh, hard to explain to people, really hard. There's there's others out there uh, that are also hard to right. explain, but they're popular amongst a certain trading community. Sure. What? How do you explain it to people? What say, all right, I need some downside protection. Can you, I think is, when you, is there a problem with the complexity of these products? Yeah, I mean, surely if you don't, I understand, like, I mean, obviously the levered ones, but these covered calls are a little bit different. You just basically can tell the people, like, okay, you're going to limit your losses to the downside, right? That's number one. You want to limit, you don't want to go off 30% drawdown anymore. You know, but at, if you sell options, right, and, and the market moves against you, you'll be protected, but you're going to just reduce your upside. So you reduce your upside potential for these, you know, the market's up 30%, or how come I'm up 20? Well, because you are buying protection the whole time. It's, it's, it's really a risk appetite, right, Ben, for what kind of that client wants. If they don't want the risk, this really is their only option because it is very complex to try to hedge on your own. And that's why they're a good tool. So that's a good point. So Ben, maybe respond to that because it, he's right. I mean, as hard as it is for me to explain to people what these things do, it's harder for somebody who wants to hedge on their own. They do make hedging a little simpler, right? Yeah. Package. It's good. Look, I think, uh, look, Andrew hit it perfectly, but it's good news, bad news. On the good news side, you know, the toolkit has expanded immensely over the last couple of years, and it's going to continue to grow. That said, the, the negative is really trying to parse all of these different products, really understand what you're owning and, and explain that to investors or even advisors who are struggling to keep up with the nuances between these products. So you cited a, you know, a couple different um, products just in the last minute, right? QYLD being one, and, and some of the double or triple levered um, you know, products linked to the Qs. Those are two very different return streams out there, and investors you know, can use them in a way to hedge risk, yeah. um, but yeah. also you know, provide some other you know, return stream, yeah. and that, that's getting more and more complicated. So um, you know, again, I think the burden will be on the issuers, yeah. Um, and to a large degree, the advisors to really kind of weed through all that and, and, and try to understand. I'll give you, you another know, one that problem. drives me crazy. That seems interesting, but I can't I can't explain it in any simple way. BUFR. It's now, buffer. this is essentially buffer. Like this is four funds um, that buffer declines in the S&P 500, essentially. Right. So they're designed to limit losses. They, they use options with, with spread out expirations Correct. in them. Uh, and it's easy to remember. That's why I'm bringing it up because BUFR is yeah, easy buffer. to remember. No, that's buffer. Why you're it's easy to yeah. remember, yeah. but it's fairly complex. Here. Yes. Well, the spread is good. I mean, when you had the products that came out with the futures, like the oil and the energy products, remember those? They were like, hey, we're rolling every month. 
And so you would have a systematic risk of the, of the ETF being too big. The spread out option collars really allow it to have a smooth transition. And they're laddered. I mean, that's what they are. Yeah. But I, I actually think when you're talking about how do you explain it to investors, well, the name is perfect. You're buffered on both sides. You, you have yeah. limited left. It's literally a collar. Yeah, it's a collar. And I think yeah. that who's it good for? If you have a 50 year old investor that just went through this process and it was like, I'm not retired yet, but man, I don't want to be down when I am retired in, in 10 years and you're getting to this period and you still want to be an ETF, so you're an RIA that represents these type of clients, Buffer is going to be a good option for you for your clients that are in a lower risk, yeah. a little lower portfolio. Uh, ben, there are the uh, usual attempts out there. Uh, I'm moving on to another topic here, chasing the inflation trade, which hasn't gone away. Um, Simplify as an interesting product, PFIX, uh, the Simplify, um, the interest rate hedge ETF. Uh, and it provides a hedge against uh, a, a big increase in long-term interest rates uh, by holding um, interest rate options uh, and treasuries and, and treasury inflation protected securities tips. Uh, this gets crazy complicated to explain this, too, as an effort to just sort of hedge inflation. Yep. Well, yeah, again, here we are again, right, talking about another sophisticated product, but a, another tool investors can use. Yeah, I mean... Look, TIP is a monster, um, but then there's these products like PFIX that have come along um, that are really trying to isolate um, this concept of providing an inflation hedge. And, and not surprisingly, in the first half, this was an incredible performer. It was at the top of the leaderboard. Obviously, you can see the chart. It has since cooled, right? But there are other products that are coming onto the market that issuers are trying to um, really gain, you know, investor interest in to be able to just provide these ways to play. Another great example is really like the like a direction product that just launched BRKY that is designed to provide exposure to commodities that you find at your breakfast table, right? Another yeah. way yeah. for investors to, you know, try to play, you know, this inflation trade. But again, um, I think the longer term play and what we're going to see more of is some interest um, in the fixed income ETFs, specifically in the actively managed space. Yeah. Again, I think we are seeing some early signs that investors are you know, just yeah. looking for some professional management to, to really help navigate these tricky waters. And it, you know, some early signs that we're seeing flow there and the issuers are lining up to launch product. You know, I'm so old, Andrew. I remember that really the only way to do inflation, play inflation, was TIPS, Treasury yeah. TIP, the original yeah. one, with Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. Yeah. Whatever happened to that? I mean, it's still there, it's, but I get the sense, like, there's not enough it's return. There, but look, there's another new product. So PPI just came out. That's a multi-asset. Um, actually, one of your guests on the show from, I believe it's uh, an RAA that comes on your show all the time, is is behind that. That's, that's global stocks commodities, because inflation is not just a U.S. story, right? So the tips are a set product. And even the product we mentioned before that Ben mentioned, PFIX, they're using OTC derivatives that mirror long-term treasuries, right? They're more efficient, makes the product more efficient, makes them charge a little bit less. It's not the same story as, as it was. But hey, the good news is we ruled out Bitcoin as an inflation hedge. So. Well, thank goodness. And by the way, this is the first time anybody's mentioned Bitcoin yeah, on this show. And I'm not out. planning on bringing it up, it's all right? So just, just, just so you know. I want to move on and talk about, I'm moving to a different subject now, single stock ETFs. We've had eight of them launched recently. Yep. Um, uh, and there's a lot of discussion here. Um, what's going on here? Is there going to be one for every big cap ETF? It seems like that's potential, like the top 100 are going to get all the leverage and inverse ETFs around them, single stock. Now, Innovator launched uh, a hedge test. Yeah, that's strategy. two kind of different products, right? right. That's like buffer for right. one stock. Right. Yeah. TSLH. It aims yeah. uh, to provide the price Correct. return uh, of the Tesla stock up to a cap and hedges the downside risk over a three month period. Now, that's 10%. not a leverage and inverse, but yeah. you, I, I guess what I'm trying to get at here, I want to specifically talk about single stock yes. ETFs in general. It is a single stock yep. ETF with a buffer. Um, wh wh why now with all of these products and how do you feel about them? I believe they came out due to the popularity of the retail trader. Mm. And again, they saw, I, you know, just because you can lose. So to keep it simple, if you short a, if you short a stock, you have infinite losses, right? That's what the traders need to do. They can short a stock and go to a yeah. Wherever. Never mind. I've never met anyone who had an infinite losses, loss. But, but it's on paper. Theoretically, no, yes. Theoretically. You can only lose, but you could, let's say, right, forget infinite. You can lose three times what you put in the Tesla by shorting. You yeah. short $1,000, oh my gosh, I'm down 3000 
with this, let's say TSLQ, second most successful launch of an ETF this year. That's the short test. It's only been out a month, right? Dollar in volume. You can now only lose what you put in. Hey, I'm going to bet $1,000 that Tesla's going down. That will eventually go to zero over the course of time, right? Like that most of these ETFs, just like the lever ones do. You'll only lose your $1,000. So it's appealing to those people. And of course, that want to short without the downside of shorting. And no margin. No margin. And international investors who can't yeah, short. But wait a minute. Short. You're paying 1%. Oh, you're paying. 1.2%. You're paying. It's not free. No, like, oh my God, I just found something. It includes the cost to borrow. And I'm sure Ben can speak to that being, yeah. you, know, you know, but the hedge includes the cost to borrow for the, you know, the PM. So it's all factored in. Yeah. But again, the, the, the person on Robinhood can now short. They're going to be happy yeah. about that. Ben, talk about this. What, what's the upside and the downside of these, of these single stock ETFs? I mean, the advantage is, we just said, these single stock levered ETFs, they're more accessible uh, than shorting and using margin. So, uh, but what's the downside yeah, here? Yeah, look, uh, the convenience aspect of that, and I think um, you hit the points perfectly earlier, is is huge, right? But it's important that these products also, you know, have their downsides and, and in many ways, um, you know, work similar to many of the leverage and short products that are out there now, such as the daily reset. And again, this concept that, you know, it's, it is daily and, you know, you're not going to track the cumulative returns over, let's say, a six-month or a 12-month period. But look, the race is on with the ETF issuers. First mover here is key. So you are going to see the spaghetti on the wall approach, in my view. Um, we have a line um, that is growing quickly on our platform to launch these products and bring these to market. So yes, you are going to see um, products pretty much up and down some of the larger, you know, larger mega cap names. And I think you're going to see multiple tickers uh, now for each of those stocks out there. Um, and look, some of these these products are going to be quite volatile. Um, you know, again, you look at the vol of a Tesla, right, or some of the other stocks that, you know, assuming they come out, you are going to see um, some significant risk. Now, you know, again, you can't lose more than you put in. Um, but but again, the betas on these products are going to be very, very high. And there's going to be uh, the traditional confusion right. um, in the market on how they work. Right. And I think right. so, an added bonus on the tickers. Yeah, I'm sorry. The daily reset, I've been trying to ex explain it for 15 years, and people yeah. still can't get their heads around a daily reset on this. Yeah. So what I'm concerned with is the top 100 stocks are all going to have these leverage and inverse ETFs. Uh, and I don't think it's a coincidence that on the week the first group launched, Gary Gensler at the SEC comes out and makes a statement about leverage and inverse in general, yeah. that, they're, that they're very risky products. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that, that's a shot across the bow here. Even though they have not tried to stop these products, yeah, they, they obviously had some concerns about their, their, their impact on the market yeah. and investors not knowing what they're doing. Well, investors need to look at it. It's going to be the same. I mean, maybe, again, you could bet on like, you know, Commodore Computer. Some stocks will go to zero, but the general market doesn't. If you looked at a chart of the short S&P levered ETFs over years, they're all go to zero. I mean, they actually reset, but they go like, you know, because of the daily reset and because the market generally goes up. So that alone, we should, everybody in the show should learn. These are short term bets unless you are betting that the stock is going to zero. Right, yeah. Ben? <laughs> Without a doubt. I mean, but that, Bob, that concept, again, is is for whatever reason, um, despite some efforts there, just, you know, eluded some investors who just, you know, still struggle with that concept. And it's just, again, important to remind investors that, uh, again, uh, these products are no different than than the other, you know, sort of index-based products that have been out there for, for years. But possibly yeah. more volatile right. with single well, stocks. That's so I don't think Coke is going to It resets every day. Yeah. It's not, Coke is not going to be it's the It's not going to move around. Yeah, yeah, that isn't the issue. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's going to, something around Tesla or something around sure. some other more yeah. high beta GameStop. Stuff what if they put general. around on GameStop, yeah. right? And, and yeah. we're going to be blue in the face saying it's, it's resets daily yeah. and, and it's and still going to happen. And yeah. somebody's going to still have a problem yeah. and they're going to, we're going to have to go around explaining things again Correct. to everybody. And Charles that's what, Schwab's got a lot of work to do. That's what I yeah. have a problem with. But yeah, there's going yeah. to be a lot of uh, legal statements around yeah. these things when they launch. Ben, you're going to be very busy with, with your department <laughs> explaining this Always. to everybody in the next few weeks. We're going to have you back, Ben, because you're very good at explaining that. Thank you guys uh, for joining us. That does it for this week's ETF Edge. My thanks to Ben and Andrew. We've asked uh, Andrew to stick around and talk a bit more about what he is seeing in ETF flows on the ETF Edge podcast coming right up. And remember, you can see all of our shows on the website, etfedge.cnbc.com. Everybody have a healthy, happy, safe trading week. 
Get the ABCs of ETFs with the ETF Edge newsletter, your weekly update on the hottest trends in the nearly $4 trillion market of exchange-traded funds, expert analysis, actionable ideas, and exclusive insight from host Bob Pisani. Sign up now at cnbc.com forward slash ETF Edge newsletter.